current information on improving your relationship advice. Welcome to Oxygen 365. I'm your host, Noel Metter, and this is episode number 16. Today's guests are Dr. Harvel Hendricks and Dr. Helen LaKelly Hunt. Together, they have co-created Imago Relationship Therapy, which is a therapy for couples now practiced by over 2,000 certified therapists in 30 countries. They've also uh, co-authored 10 books on intimate relationships and parenting. Oprah has called Harville the marriage whisperer, and he has appeared on her show 18 times. Helen is an honored uh, inductee in the National Women's Hall of Fame. Together, they have six children. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank Very you. glad to be here. Yes. You. you know, and on today's show, we're going to be covering this book called Getting the Love You Want. And I wanted to start out with asking the question, what experiences led you to write this book? Well, uh, shall I start? Um, <clears throat> the um, experience was that we both, when we met, were divorced. And we got interested early, and I had been a professor of marriage and family therapy at a uh, graduate university in Dallas, the SMU. And we were interested in the fact that we were both seemed to be, you know, good people, and our ex uh, partners were good people. Like, why in the world were we divorced? Hmm. And so we began a conversation. Why, at the why especially was he? getting a divorce when he taught marriage and family therapy at yes. Perkins <laughs> Theology School. Yeah. So he came he came back from the divorce court to his class and um, and I met him soon after that. And um, as we started dating, as he was a single parent, I was a single parent, uh, we started dating and after uh, several dates, I asked him if he could wave a magic wand, what would he do with his life? Mm. He said, I want to understand why do couples fight? I knew everything to do. I even taught it. And how did I end up with my wife fighting so bad that we got a divorce? And I sort of felt the same way. So that's how it came about. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, And I was in um, clinical practice working with... um, individuals largely and with some couples at the time but as Helen said teaching marriage and family therapy and the um, the other uh, sort of impetus was that we getting a divorce then were where we were a part of the divorce ecosystem of which were 50 percent of couples uh, Mm -hmm. at that time Mm -hmm. so started the divorce rate started up in 1955 reached about 50% 50% by 1972 and you know has hung around that midpoint now for 75 years. So we wanted to know why do couples fight and so we started this conversation, we started a research project, uh, it took about eight years to um, do those um, and we spent it the eight years uh, actually experimenting with uh, therapeutic interventions with couples and asking also interviewing them about why were they fighting uh, to get their story rather than bring a clinical theory to why do couples fight, we ask them, how come we fight? So this book um, is a result of um, our conversations, co- co-created um, a lot, a lot of conversation that led ultimately to putting it into that into that form. So that's where it comes from. It's trying to answer, trying to answer our own question. Yeah. So it sounds like the impetus was somewhat the the pain was a catalyst yes. towards what this book has become. Is that would that be a fair assu- assessment? The pain and the curiosity. Okay. Uh, both of them came up. Yes. Okay. But the of course there wouldn't have been as much curiosity had there not been that much pain. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. Wow. Back true. on it. Puts a lot of us on the road, doesn't it? Yeah. So I, I think what was fascinating to me as I started reading through this and looking at it was this idea that you guys talk about of the subconscious brain versus the conscious brain. Can you elaborate on that for our listeners? Um, yeah, you want to go with that or no, shall I? Don't do I that? That. Yeah, you do that. All right. <laughs> so, you guys uh, are too cute. <laughs> this is my part of the lecture and the workshop, so I'll go ahead and yeah. um, that it's... Well, Sig- we'll see how well you do it. So. <laughs> uh, Sigmund Freud said that uh, when you think about the conscious and the unconscious, that it's really like an iceberg, that um, 
an iceberg when you're in an ocean on a boat and you see an iceberg, you see the tip of the iceberg. Uh -huh. It's a white little peak, but it's attached to this massive, uh, dark, complex um, world under um, the water, this mound of rock that has shipwrecks in it and it's um, eels and slime, algae, <laughs> like just a, to really discuss, you know, all sorts of weird things. And that, that that's who we are, that we think we're a pristine, nice, orderly little part, but that's what we're aware of. That's the conscious self and underneath is the unconscious. So we um, really, um, it was Harville that came up with this idea that the unconscious purpose of, of marriage is to finish childhood yeah. mm -hmm. um, and redo and possibly reheal some of those childhood wounds. Um, when I met Harville, I was getting a master's in counseling psych and actually went halfway through a PhD in clinical psych. Um, but one of the things I had done um, in getting a master's was work, uh, work toward reparenting. There was a reparenting technique that was conscious, I mean, popular at that time. So both of us were very interested in the fact that you can be unconsciously drawn to someone um, for reasons that are different from your conscious reasons. You may mm -hmm. think consciously, wow, this person's going to be so much fun. They seem to be everything that I want. But unconsciously, we're pulled into a relationship with someone that is not going to be the person to meet our needs, who on Harville uses the phrase, incompatibility is sadly the grounds for marriage. We're all mm -hmm. drawn to people wow. that we're incompatible with. But if we grow to heal each other's wounds, we become compatible, but we also move into being the best we can be as we heal our partner. So is, is the conscious more of the attraction aspect of the relationship and the subconscious is more of the healing of the wounds? Well, I think the way it works is that the uh, attraction is mediated through the unconscious mind. Okay. And that, uh, as uh, Helen was quoting Freud, Freud uh, is actually the source of this uh, um, theory of a dual consciousness. That is one that operates outside of your awareness and the other one is your awareness operating outside. But your partner choice is mediated through unconscious perception. Although your conscious mind at the time is deluded that it's making the decision. But it's the push from the emotional brain into the cognitive brain. So you got to be attracted to somebody to fall in love with them. And if you are attracted to somebody and fall in love with them, they're going to be similar to the caretakers with whom you experience your childhood wounds. And that sets up an anticipation that those wounds, will, those needs will be met with this person. That's what fuels the excitement, but it's all at an unconscious level. I see. So I, I think a lot of us are really aware of this whole idea of conscious, but I think the subconscious is oftentimes this missing component. Can you help elaborate a little bit more on the unconscious brain? Like what, what is, when you, when you talk about what is that? Well, you want to say more about that? Well, just because I do in the workshop, but yeah, <laughs> the, 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 the um, neuroscientists have for decades been saying in a general way, there are three parts of the brain, the lower brain, the midbrain, and the upper brain, that, that the brain in general can be subdivided in that way. And um, they call the lower brain the reptilian brain. But Harlan and I really, when we work with couples, we try to vivify the fact that your partner has a, a reptile, a reptilian response to things. Mm. It's sort of mm. like a crocodile. And that if you come across to your partner as someone who's not safe for them, this little sleepy character, like a crocodile who looks like they're just sunbathing by the swamp on the beach in Florida <laughs> or Georgia, that if they get irritated, like they can just suddenly, you know, open their mouth and snap your arm off. So there's your partner does have that fierce um, reactive energy. Um, and so we really think understanding brain health is important.
to a couple learning neuroregulation. And I have a feeling I'm not exactly answering your question around unconscious and the selection process, but let me let, I'll let, let me, if I'm not answering it, Harville will take that thread a bit, but I do want to mention, Noel, since I had the floor, yeah. that, um, <laughs> that Freud said anatomy is destiny and the brain you're born with is the brain you have the rest of your life. But the neuroscientists in the 1990s had the breakthrough that the brain can be changed by the thoughts you run through your brain. Mm -hmm. And it's by understanding the brain and understanding how you can learn neural regulation and stay out of the crocodile brain. You can actually, you can't change your first thought, they say, but you can change your second and the third. And so this kind of neural regulation is very empowering for the couple. But is your question more about the lower brain and the attraction? Well, maybe we can move into, I think so. Uh, Arvo, is there anything that you'd add to that? Kind of just the subconscious brain and what it is? Well, the, uh, the what it can add to it is that uh, since uh, Freud set up, as Helen said, a tripartite brain, yeah. uh, which was a, a um, cognitive brain, an emotional brain, and a reactive brain or instinctual brain, which is the reptile brain. And through the past century, uh, brain people have modified Freud somewhat to say they're not regions of the mind, but that uh, unconscious is, a, is, is simply a, they're, they're conscious things and then there are things out of your awareness. And the unconscious is what's out of your awareness. And that 95% of what runs our lives is out of our awareness and that we are aware of only about 5%. But we think we are fully in charge. Mm. But if we had to be in charge of all of the things that we do, we couldn't get anything done. That we are like a machine that runs runs by itself. Okay. So that's a part of it, is that the power and enormity of the unconscious influence in our lives. And that, that's what, that, un, that stuff that's out of awareness is what functions to select your partner. Okay, uh, okay, that, that helps. Um, so let's take this this more brain uh, idea and move it into the relationship. And I think you guys, you, you spent some time talking about the difference between the subconscious and conscious partnership. Let, maybe help our listeners understand what is that, I mean, that, that unconscious versus conscious partnership. Well, <clears throat> a conscious partnership is a term that Helen and I are um, – basically using to describe what we think is an emergent new uh, intimate partnership, emergent in our culture. Um, we use the word intimate partnership because it includes more than people who get married. Okay. Uh, although most uh, people who develop a conscious partnership do move toward marriage because it becomes so attractive. Mm -hmm. And that, um, so the, um, what we mean by conscious is Helen gives a, a great, and you may want to chime in on this, a great thing in the workshop about what we mean by conscious, but basically means in a conscious partnership, you know about your unconscious and you know about your past. You know that you were wounded and your partner is wounded so that when you go into the relationship, you don't go in with simply an idealization that we're going to live happily ever afterwards because you know that your unfinished childhood business is going to show up in your relationship in a negative way. And that most of your problems are going to arise out of those unconscious experiences being triggered by current interactions. And uh, the new terms that are coming out of the brain sciences in the past 15 years is implicit and explicit memory. And implicit memory are memories of feelings with no event attached. Like you just feel uh, scared, but you don't know why. Mm -hmm. Helen does X, it'll trigger my fear feeling, but I, so therefore I think Helen did something because I don't know that all Helen did was be Helen, but it triggered a memory in me that was emotional, but I can't attach it to my mother so I can't say, hey, you're reminding me of my mother. There's no reference. So those feelings are there. They're immortal, eternal. 
They have no space, no place in time. They're timeless. And Helen can do, she can look at me a certain way and I'll go, an go anxious. Why am I doing that? So there's another whole set of memories that begin when we're four years old, around three to, three to five, depending on how your hippocampus and brain develops. But the median point is about age four, you develop a brain structure called the hippocampus. And that's like a library. And there, all events are recorded. Every event you experience is recorded along with the emotion that goes with the events. So if Helen does a certain thing, and I'll say, ouch, that's sort of what happened in childhood for me. You know, I couldn't get my mother's attention or, you know, she looked at me that way. Now I know I'm being triggered by memory. Uh, Helen, Helen is the trigger, but I'm the one reacting to the trigger. It's not Helen's fault. It's just that Helen moved a certain way. My brain remembers those movements were connected to a painful memory in childhood that my mother did. Right. But if it were under age four, I would have the same reaction, but I wouldn't know where it came from. I would just assume it's because Helen doesn't like me. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So this moves when you're in a conscious partnership. You're aware that if something happens over and over again, it's from the past. And that it has to do with your unfinished agenda, not with your partner's bad behavior. Got it. So those are that's one big piece of that. And so then the second piece, I would think, is that you then decide how you're going to live your life. When you do have a trigger, you, you have intentional repair processes. And that could be whatever repairs. Could be an apology. Could be you have to have a long conversation. Could be you have to bring roses. Could be you have to, you know, say... Uh, I love you, or whatever would repair. But in a conscious partnership, you're 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 aware of that. And then I think the last thing I'll say, and Ellen, you may want to add, is you're aware it's a partnership, and that it's not about you. You are about your partnership. And when you take care of the partnership, which you both own, the partnership then serves you. But if you say, "Hey, I think I want my money," uh, you know, and we'll do it my way, then you've broken the partnership. And then you suffer because you're not going to get your needs met. The partnership suffers. It's no longer a resource. Right. In a conscious partnership, you're where your relationship is a partnership and that your responsibility is to take care of the partnership, not you, with the paradox that if you do take care of the partnership, you will get your needs met. Yeah. But you don't take care of the partnership you won't get your needs met. Let me start with asking a question. I think this is so powerful, but I think for our listeners, do you have a story that you can relate this to? An example to kind of break down this conscious versus subconscious partnership? Yeah, this it, this is really in-depth in depth, in depth uh, terminology. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I, could tell, yeah. I could tell one tell story, story um, um, that is more about the partnership model shifting um because i think the lower brain is a fight or flight and the unconscious uh, just wants to obliterate anyone who's different or especially if they're dangerous um and the um the upper brain is can create win-wins like you can be right and i can be right both so okay. it's a different okay. part of the brain this is what we can consciously do but if we stay unconscious, we have this fight or flight. Um, and um, the story that I would tell has to do with the fact that um, when Harville says we are a relationship, we don't have a relationship, we are a relationship. Um, a relationship is composed of one person, a second person, and the space between the two people. And the job of two people in a relationship is to keep the space between safe. And you unconsciously, you're not going to do that because you'll lambast your partner if it's dangerous. But if you're in your conscious mind, you will learn to keep the, say, the space between safe where your healthy partner can emerge instead of your defended partner. Um, and so the story I would tell about that is one day um, we were fighting all the time. Like this was 15 years ago. And 
we were going, oh my goodness. And no, we haven't fought since then. I was going to say, man, you guys are on a great track record. <laughs> well, we really had a terrible dating this years. Was, this was a bad time. And, and then, so I said, oh, well, we have to go to therapy. You are so famous. We have to go to therapy. And he went, oh, I'm not going to therapy. I said, you are going to therapy. So we went to therapy. I always do what she says. Yeah. <laughs> We fired that therapist because we knew what they were trying to do and we're smarter than them. So we went to the second therapist and we fired that therapist too. Cause we, the, but the fifth therapist we went to, the top therapist in New York, uh, fired us, calling us the couple from hell. Like we were just having the worst relationship. So we were desperate and um, we actually called a divorce lawyer and we loved each other. We just bought. Yeah. And we both said, you're so famous, and we're fighting, and it's just not integrous to stay married. So when we were we were really talking about this, but then we tried to have dates. And one night at a date time, we read we, we tried to do something unusual. So we decided to read a book on relationships that had little messages for certain birthdays, like a horoscope. Mm -hmm. And we looked up his, his birthday and mine, and there was a message. And it said that you're about to eradicate and decimate your relationship due to the negative scrutiny you give each other. And I went, what negative scrutiny? Mm. I'm not negative. <laughs> and um, I couldn't understand how I was being negative. I mean, I was trying to improve Harville and help him be a better person. Right. So I, I thought, you know, I'm not and look even, what you did. I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not even I'm char person. charging him for my <laughs> advice, but that landed negative on him. And you know, he would say, so we decided to monitor the space between. And out of that came the zero negativity concept where every night we check at the end of the day if either of us has done something that inadvertently fell negative on the other. And we've been doing that for 15 years and Harville is so faithful. Every night we take out the calendar and in it, we've learned to catch little things when they're small mm -hmm. and do a redo. Like if something I said was negative to him that day, mm -hmm. he'll go, I, that was negative and let's do a redo and he'll coach me. And so that's a practical example. Yeah. of Super yeah. helpful. But that means we're conscious in our partnership. Right. And do we intentionally engage in behaviors we know are connecting? Yeah healing because we know what each other's childhood wound is and that if we do X, we won't activate that memory. And if we do Y, we will in fact increase our bonding. Um, and that's what Helen's talking about. So we do these appreciations and we also monitor our, what we call um, uh, the um, negativity. We start, no negativity in our relation. And of course we fail, but we have a repair process. And the story is that uh, Helen, Helen, I, when I mess up, um, Helen has a real easy on ramp for me. She says, "Well, just apologize uh, or redo it." And for me, I take things a little more deeply and personally. I just want—I want a full dialogue. I want to really talk about it. But it's our repair process. So when it's my turn, she helps me with doing it the way it touches me and heals me. And when I when uh, I injure her. Uh, I do what will touch her. So that's what we mean by you have a partnership that you take care of and you keep the negativity out of it. Keep the, um, we call them affirmations in it of all different kinds. And you manage the repair process so that you never get stuck in a long-term um, separation from each other emotionally. Yeah, that's good. And so this, this whole concept of the subconscious conscious brain, even partnership, it sounds like it has a lot to do with the childhood wounds in an individual. And it, as I understand it, and I could be wrong, so maybe clarify for me, but the subconscious uh, oftentimes is related to the, child, the childhood wound that has happened, and then we're playing that out in a conscious way uh, in this relationship, in this partnership. Uh, I guess my question to you is, is it even possible to go back and heal the child? the childhood wound from a time previous that's maybe subconscious that's operating now in, in this, uh, the forefront of a relationship. So, so I'll go make a run at that. Um, 
So we've been working on the uh, Imago, you know, that the intellectual side of the Imago system for about uh, what thirty years now. What what is the what is Imago? I'm sorry, I, I'm I'm not sure if I. Well, Imago is the name of the coupled therapy that Helen and I developed. Okay. Which which is described in Getting All of You Want. Got it. Uh, and Imago, Imago means. <laughs> and Imago is the Latin word for image. Thank you. And it also, the image refers to the picture in your mind created by your interactions with your caretakers, not just mom and dad, but whoever was important in your childhood. You create a picture of them, and that picture is used to select your intimate partner in adult life. Wow. So the Imago, when you have an Imago match, it means Helen has traits that match my childhood caretakers. The worst the worst and the ones, worst and the worst as ones. well as good ones wow ones and if he's my imago match which everyone is it, it they end up at the altar with their imago match that he too i'll think i'll my conscious mind will tell me he's so great but i've really married someone who's a jerk <laughs> somebody <laughs> who's going to trigger her childhood her childhood memories around which needs were not met and she's going to want me to meet those needs. And the problem is, for most couples, this is where it really gets tough, is that the need she wants me to meet is from a part of me, uh, like in my case, I can talk about that my emotional side. Mm -hmm. uh, Helen wants me to express myself emotionally to her. And now I can, but years ago, I couldn't. I was too cortical and cerebral. Um, but my emotions, I had to shut them down in childhood to survive in my family. Mm -hmm. So I, Helen marries some, and she's full of emotions. So she marries somebody who has more of a cortical orientation. And I look for somebody who has an emotional orientation to life. But she wants me to be emotional right. and say, love you in such a way that she can feel that I'm feeling my love rather than just saying, I love you. Don't you get it? Uh, I gave you roses and flowers and we went to Greece. Uh, isn't that love? Well, no, not, that doesn't matter. It's, it's the tone of the voice when you say, I love you, and I don't need to go to Greece uh, huh. to get to be. Well, well Greece is okay. It's but, a nice bonus. <laughs> but, but, but it doesn't take the place of an emotional communication of love. Um, so um, I think I lost my train of thought now. That, that 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 you Harville had to grow the parts yes, of him right. that were we call a lost the lost parts of ourselves mm. and me yeah. since Thank you paused you. I'll you. just share that's where I was going I'll just share I have the emotions but I can't speak succinctly like if you ask me how I'm feeling you get a paragraph or two <laughs> and, and, and if I'm trying to tell Harville about something that concerns me it's uh, and I've had to learn to develop mental strength to be clear and precise uh, or else I flood Harville with my words okay I had to strengthen my because he'll go you've been talking five minutes <laughs> that I am tired forget it let's I'm not I'm not <laughs> well, that's in the old Star days. Trek is coming on I've got to watch TV <laughs> So, so in the old days, yeah. but, but I had to really know it's horrible to just flood your partner with your emotions. So I got in time a very orderly, healthy no. cortical side of my brain, the rational, I increased rational strength mm -hmm. and you've increased the capacity for empathy. Yeah. And empathic acumen. So and like in Helen's, we healed each other. In Helen's childhood, in her family, they valued women and didn't value women being smart. So her cortical side didn't get mirrored and valued. In my family, they valued you being able to solve problems. Hmm. They didn't care about your feelings. Hmm. So I survived because I could solve problems. I was on a farm. You know, you have to solve a lot of problems on the farm. Right. But we didn't have feel we got to go to work and Helen grew up in a very different emotional family so I come to the marriage needing emotion uh, but without uh, marrying emotion because it's not in myself she marries the 
cortical structure because she's brilliant, much smarter than me, but her mind wasn't valued as a child. So the, the thing about, that's the brilliant thing about how the unconscious puts people together is that when she wants me to be emotional, she's asking for a part of me that had to shut down. But if I open it up and work on getting into my feelings and feeling my love for her, I get my feelings and she gets healed because, uh, you know, she, uh, she has a response because her parents also, you weren't quite sure they weren't very emotional about their love. It was like, and we take care of you, but it wasn't like an emotional certainty and vice versa. Uh, Helen, uh, responds to me by making shorter sentences and being clearer when she's talking, she develops her cortical brain. Uh, and so what she gets is an organized brain that can actually do amazing things. And, uh, and I get, uh, and I get out of chaos, which I had in, in, uh, in other places in my childhood. So you see that marriage, uh, the unconscious brings incompatible people together and their incompatibility is the energy for growth. If they will stay in, you know, pulling the wagon together and not one run off because, hey, it looks like we're incompatible. That's the point. Incompatibility is the grounds for marriage. So I got to ask the questions because this is, I mean, you're, you're, I think what you're describing here is for a lot of couples, what they're dealing with when you talk about the issues, the, you know, why we're incompatible or even the right. fights that we're having. How do we, I, I, how do you heal? Uh, the, the, in, in terms of practically the needs of your partner. Uh, yeah, that's the question that, that we started with. Can I with. say an on ramp? Yeah, do an on ramp. So, sure. uh, as a prolegomena, just to mention, we're not sure that we could heal each other, but you can definitely avoid re wounding each other. Uh, okay. And you learn to re wound. And over time, you know, there's a, a, a certain degree of healing, but it's not like he's never invulnerable. Got it. His wound is probably, and my wound is definitely always there. Yep. That, that's, right. And that's the really important point I started to say, and then, then I got off track about, can you heal it? And when we started 25 years ago, we were operating in a, a kind of an assumptive system that was a part of the mental health field at the time that you could actually heal childhood wounds. What we've learned in the, all the years of working with couples and in our own relationship is that if you mean by healing that you're never vulnerable to that childhood trigger again, we think that that's not the case. Uh, that the wounding occurred in relationship in childhood and that relationship with the caretakers and the child got ruptured. So what we now know works is that our relationship has to be safe so that that wounding and we don't do transactions uh, like we got in childhood so that we don't. So healing is healing the relationship okay. and that keeps us safe from the retriggering. And what we think from the best, we're not brain scientists, but we read brain material is that you can never really get rid of those neural pathways of painful memories, okay. but you can build a road alongside them. You know, like the freeways you see, right. you see this, you see this road to the right. Yep. Uh, and that was the old road before they put in um, the interstate. So you can build a new highway, but that old road is always going to be there. And the beautiful thing is once you're on this new road where you're into a safe relationship and something happens, you know immediately when you're on the old road. Yeah. And what we help couples do is know how to get back on the highway. Got it. They get back on the highway. That just means they go back to safety. Then they experience connecting. And now we're into the place we would have been always if our parents uh, had had that for themselves when they were little and had had it for us when we were little. Yeah. You know, and it's relational. Yeah. And, you know, I, what I loved about your guys' book is that, you know, a lot of books are written in a way that you just read it and then you kind of put it down and you walk away. You guys were very intentional about not only writing great stuff, but also saying, and here's the action we want you to take. Here's the exercise that comes with it. I mean, this is... This is an experiential book. This is like two months of wading into some deep, yeah. deep topics together, which I love that. And I thought maybe just for our listeners, uh, tell them a little bit about this behavior change request dialogue. I, I thought that was really fascinating. Okay. 
So the behavior change progressive dialogue is a, um, an elaboration of dialogue, which is the core mechanism for connecting and creating a safe relationship. And dialogue is a structured conversation, which I mirror Helen back. Uh, I say, let me see if I got that. Did I get it? And is there more about that? I ask. So I go into curiosity. Helen tells me more, and I keep mirroring. And at some point, she says, well, um, no, there's no more. And I say, well, let me see if I got it all. You just X, Y, and Z, and is, did I get a? Did I get it all? And I say, and that makes sense. That's right. a validation. Right. And when I say that's a validation, that means I see you. I see your brain. I'm not looking at my brain. I'm looking at your brain. Your brain makes sense. Hmm. And I leave it alone. I'm not going to say you make sense, but you're crazy. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to say you make sense, and I accept that, and I can imagine that's empathy. So that's an exercise. Sometimes it, this is always the on-ramp for any conversation. Sometimes you have a frustration and you want to bring the frustration. And I could say to Helen, I get frustrated when we had a plan at seven and you weren't there or she vice versa with me. So the behavior change request is that I would like to deal with uh, time and with, you know, with lateness. And so I convert my frustration into a wish mm. and because every frustration is, an, is a, a disguised wish. So I say, instead of, you're always late, I wish you were on time, uh, when are you ever gonna be punctual? I say instead, uh, Helen, uh, I, have a, I have a request. Uh, when we have a, uh, a meeting next time at a restaurant at seven, um, I would really love for you to let me know if something is delaying you. So give me a call ahead of time so I'll know that, that you're going to be late. Also, I'll know that you're not dead because, uh, you know, you might be late because you got run over by a car. Just don't want to be anxious or angry. So call me and let me know and, uh, and do it mm, 30 minutes before 7. So I'll have a 30-minute window in there. And then I'll know how to use that 30 minutes of time. And Helen would say, let me see if I got that. If I did... When, when we have an appointment and I'm late, you want me to call you 30 minutes ahead of time, uh, did I get it? And um, so, so we'll go through clarifying that. And then the next step is that uh, we will talk about maybe two or three options about lateness. It might be call me 30 minutes ahead of time. It might be call me 30 minutes ahead of time. And when you get there, give me a big kiss. Uh, or... Um, when you get there, give me a, a, a deep apology. So there are three options, mm -hmm. and I pick the one I want. Uh, and then Helen says, okay, I can do that. When I get there, I'm 30 minutes late. You want a big kiss, I'm going to give you a big kiss and say I'm sorry. So now that's the BCR, the Behavior Change Request Process. So if you go through that process, we call it moving from conflict to co-creation. So the marriages don't have to live in conflict. Conflict is just an energy for resolution. Mm -hmm. And you can live a you can you can't live a tension free relationship, but you can live a conflict conflict free relationship if you have a certain methodology that helps use the polarities of difference. Uh, if, if, for Harville, growth. if Harville expresses frustration, suddenly the space between is unsafe. It's toxic. No. But if Harville asks me if I'm available for a request and he makes a request, I, I feel respected and I'm open to and, answer. And it's still safe yep. in our relationship. And safety is not negotiable in a conscious partnership. Hmm. There's some research on, the, on a system, a, a nervous, a part of our brain system called the vagal system. And it's always on duty to register anything that says you're in a dangerous place. That could be an eye roll, tone of voice, or a comment. And, uh, and the people who've done this, Stephen Porges, who is the science researcher, brain researcher, has done this, says he's come to the conclusion safety is necessary for thriving. Hmm. If you're not safe, you can't thrive. Wow. You, might, you might get better at the way you protect yourself, but that's not thriving, that's surviving. Yes. Wow. So if you want to thrive, it has to be safe and get it. That's not negotiable because your brain is made in such a way that it knows when you're in danger 
even if you don't think so in your conscious mind. That unconscious part of your neural system, reading the environment all the time for signals, you could die here. Mm -hmm. And that if that's there, then you'll just protect yourself. If it's not there, then you will uh, connect and you'll thrive. Yeah. So safety is the bottom line. So is it is it possible? I'm just thinking about the the listener, maybe the couple who's tuning in right now and is in the state of just chaos in their relationship. They're so conflicted. Is it attainable for them to create safety by just picking up this book and and implementing the exercises? Would you say that? Yeah, generally that we see that happen, or is there a whole other step that needs to take place? Well, I think the answer to that is uh, is is. Um, Yes, that it is. And the reason is that uh, Helen and I had this experience in the 30 years that, just nearly 30 years that book has been out now, um, of pe- meeting people everywhere all over the world who said, we were in trouble. Somehow we saw your book on a bookshelf or somebody gave it to us, some serendipitous moment. We read it. Thank you for saving our marriage. Wow. So what they always mean when we ask them, well, what do you, what, how did you do it? They said, we went to part three where there are 12 exercises, and we worked our way through them. Okay. So it's like, it, what that does is move you out of your frustrated emotions, mm-hmm. move you up into your thinking brain, because you got to do the exercise, you got to read it, right. and couples okay. can, can do that. And if that doesn't work, then there's a network of uh, Imago therapists around the world that you just go to imagorelationships.org and click on therapist and you make one in a city near you. Yeah. I got to ask a question that you guys raised this concept. I've never heard it, but I think we all see it. And it is this idea of the invisible divorce that's happening Ah. in our culture. What is that? Yeah. You want to do that? Well, it's, it's two people not learning to make a request when they have a frustration that it's so painful for them to be who they fully are that they just abandon any hope that their partner will ever respond and they they just have their own life and they're married. And, um, and they're in, in fact, I read a very famous marriage therapist who said is that the way to have a good marriage is 90% of the time to stay away. You know, have ninety percent of your life with other people and ten percent with your partner. A yeah. famous marital therapist. Very famous. That wasn't us. <laughs> yeah. If, if, if I, yeah, if, I wanted if to I, clarify that. <laughs> I mentioned this person. A lot of your listeners would know, so I won't. Oh, but I anyway, that. and I just found that astounding because we're sort of the opposite. Hmm. So we believe that we're we're really anyway we're relational beings and we're meant to think and be together, but um um. The solution is, uh, here's an example of one thing that can help. When we were stressed in our marriage, we would alternate whose job it was every night before we went to bed to make sure the relationship was repaired. If we had had angry tone of voice or negative look in the eye, on Monday, it was Harville's job to go, you know, I want to make sure we're going to bed in, in connection. And anything we need to talk about and da-da-da. And then the next night, it was my turn. We called it being off-duty or on-duty. <laughs> and But that kind of thing, um, the mental health feel, I'll say one more thing and toss it to you. The mental health feel, as you may know, Noel, just emphasized for decades what really sends forward the importance of getting a great insight. And if you get the great insight that may be unconscious and suddenly it becomes conscious, then you have improved mental health. And so people would, you know, free association and dream analysis and da da da, a lot of things that could be helpful. But in the last decade, mental health is going, the big insights don't help. You know, you know how to have mental health practice. You have to figure out what makes you more healthy and practice it every day. And it's about creating healthy habits. So things like when Harville and I go to sleep at night, we, we would recommend to every couple, and we do it too, turn to your beloved, no matter how you're feeling, and offer three appreciations to them 
of three things they did that day that you appreciate. Mm -hmm. And then let them offer you three appreciations. And you begin to train your mind to notice the things that your partner is doing instead of, like me, making my list about all that Harvard wasn't doing. Mm -hmm. Like I loved those, I was so self-righteous, I made all these lists. Mm -hmm. That creates the invisible divorce. Yeah. But if you if you do little things like co-create a way that you and your partner do stay connected, even in this fast-paced fast food society, practice staying connected like three texts a day or whatever that mm -hmm. both of you can do. Co-create a way, and you 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 don't have to be invisibly divorced. Yeah. So I think just to amplify and summarize that a little bit, it, it, it's an invisible divorce but you're still married, but you're leaving, we call it a parallel marriage mm. rather than uh, an, an engaged marriage, like Helen's talking about how we're engaged. Invisible divorce is when children or jobs or spirituality or travel or other people or something gets all of your attention. You stay together to run the business of your life, your children and your money, but all of your emotional interactions and intimacy happen somewhere else mm -hmm. and you can just lose your marriage in other things yeah you know and i think that play it plays into this whole um trend that i see happening where you have people that have been married 20 30 years and you would think by that point gosh we've already gotten through the hard times you know raising kids doing family together now it's our golden years to be together and, and they're divorcing i mean i just got a phone call just this week of someone who's been married for 30 years, grandkids, and they're contemplating walking away from the relationship. And it's, you know, it's a whole walk away partner. And this makes sense. I mean, if you're doing the invisible divorce for that many years, what keeps you engaged? Why, why would I stay? Right. right. Um, the children, when the children are gone or now with the fact that there, uh, there's the, um, what do they call them? The new career thing at, instead of retiring, you, you go into a new life. Yeah. Life Retention is a program of that that AARP is doing, and that so the career or the children or whatever is moved out from between you. They were what was keeping you together, mm -hmm. and when they're gone, you look at each other and say, "Well, we're strangers, mm -hmm. and we've never interacted and engaged." And so, yes, there's nothing there to hold them together. Yeah. They've had an invisible divorce for years and now it's visible. Right. And I think what's so tragic about that is they missed out on intimacy. At the Absolutely. The core of this is what I think really at the core of what you guys are talking about is the ability to heal and redevelop intimacy in the relationship on a, on a, in a way that so many people never experience. And, uh, you know, I, that's what I love about this is that you guys don't just talk about the theory of it. I think the, the science is incredibly helpful but it's the practical ways of engaging and the exercise that you include in that. So I can't say enough about this book. It's a life changer. And if you're in a tough place in your marriage um, or just feeling like, man, we're in a rut, things aren't, we're just not connecting. We're not intimate anymore. This is a great way to re restart, re jumpstart that, uh, that relationship. So thank you for writing the book. And Hey, I just want to say thank you for being on the, on the show. This has been invaluable. So I uh, appreciate what you guys are doing and, and that uh, your work is, it's so well known and yet the opportunity to have you guys on the show has been a, a real privilege.